uh, live shows will come back and they are coming back, but live streaming is a very value, valid way and a valuable tool for musicians. There are a lot of musicians that have a problem getting gigs, but they can still find their audience and still broadcast their audience. So you should embrace it a little bit. Today on this bonus episode, we're gonna be hanging out with Larry Mitchell. Not only is he a super talented musician, a Grammy winning producer, but he is a good friend of mine. I've played on the stage with him and a couple times and he is fantastic. And today we're just gonna have a fun talk. So sit back and enjoy. What I thought we could talk about besides a ton of things is um, what's interesting is doing this series now. I'm doing a series of these videos uh, and they're uh, on the podcast. We're talking to musicians about their gear and more importantly, I want to have this conversation, which I've been having with everyone, about the fact that we're on the precipice of one of the biggest changes in history, which is you have musicians, they were already dealing with, well, think of this, everything they were dealing with in 2019, okay, high shipping rates for your gear, right, Um the way the market had changed, the new social media movement of doing social media, all these things existed. And then COVID comes and it's like kerosene on, a, on an already existing fire, accelerates all those problems. Now shipping rates, whatever you were complaining about 2019, you had no idea, right? Whatever social media is doing, that's on hyper 10 right now. You know what I mean? Um, because think about this, as you know, you you have, like you said, you've been doing social media for years now. All of a sudden, everyone, literally everyone in March of 2020 uh, yep. is like, I got to get into this pool, <laughs> You're right? And they'll jump in. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we talk about with musicians, these, whether, because the, some musicians may not realize this is happening. These are the changes. You know what I mean? How are you going to adapt to the new new things i i went and saw my first show a concert yep a couple weeks ago took an hour and 20 minutes to get through in lines to get through the security points of here's your vaccination card or your test yep. you know that's a test you know right there's this process is going to get different you know everything yeah well i mean we've we've uh we watched things grow like that part, especially live. It went from, you can't bring your own alcohol in to, we're gonna need to check you for weapons <laughs> as well as that. And now it's like, all right, so uh, have you had any, do you have a fever? <laughs> do you have a vaccination card? <laughs> Who knows what's coming next? But yeah, so that's happened. Um, I have watched uh, lots of musicians. I know lots and lots of musicians, as you do as well. Um, that immediately flow would change and then quite a few who don't flow would change and go ah oh, this is a limit this is this is a passing thing and i've heard uh we're old enough to have gone through this where people go hey you know uh you know you should release your record on cd it's like no no that's just a passing thing <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> all right and then and then um you know, you might want to look at some of the, you know, Pro Tools or Logic or any of the digital audio workstations like, no, 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 I still like tape, which is great. But, you know, the, the more stuff we leave behind, the more we end up behind. You know, you can come back vinyl is making researchers, but it's a small, a small amount. It's just another thing to have in your bin. Streaming is another thing, you know, I still make CDs, but it's obviously more streaming than anything else. And there's no place to sell CDs really other than at live shows. Um, so when I started streaming my video streaming about four years ago, and as just something else to do, and then I saw it happening more and, and it helped me, I saw the benefits of it. And then last year, uh, streaming was the only way for musicians to get out, and every musician was on on the planet was trying to stream. I, I watched Paul Simon do a stream from a corner, <laughs> bad light, <laughs> and a sound from his phone, <laughs> um, which was interesting. That you know, even he was streaming live. Uh, and then there were lots of musicians who goes, oh, you know, this will be over soon, and um, and uh, I can't figure it out, or I don't really want to do that stuff, and. Um, 
The problem is, is that it's not going to go away. Uh, live shows will come back and they are coming back, but live streaming is a very value, valid way and a valuable tool for musicians. There are a lot of musicians that have a problem getting gigs, but they can still find their audience and still broadcast their audience. So you should embrace it a little bit. Um, I also think that uh, for musicians who do gigs, live streaming is a benefit. You can stream from your show and charge money for that. You can stream to broadcast to promote your show. You can stream to broadcast your new material. Um, so you, I mean, all the technology, technology shouldn't be ignored. It shouldn't be like overdone, but you should like look at, evaluate when a new technology comes in and it starts to catch on, you know, all right, so how can that tool, because they're all tools, how can that tool help me? And how much of it do I have to invest or uh, time and money into it right now to bring that into my tool 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 chest? Just like if you were a carpenter or or a construction worker, and you, you know, you kind of go, oh, this new thing came out. Do I need that? Can I make money with it? Can it help me? Will it make my life easier? All right, how much does it cost? Should I invest in it now or should I wait a little bit? But they don't go ah, you know. Those drills, I'm not going to do drills. I'm just going to screw everything <laughs> by hand forever, you know, because I got that kind of time. Uh, I don't know. Did I answer your question? Was that? No, no, you, you did. It, well, like I said, what's great about this is um, <clears throat> I had a, actually, it's funny you mentioned CDs. I had a funny uh, thing that happened during COVID. Um, I have a friend who owns a small record label. And um, what happened was one night I was, uh, I was drinking adult beverages. It was a Saturday night with some friends, having a good time, listening to some music on Spotify that I, of some bands I like that happened to be signed to his label. And I got out my phone and I bought, they had a CD pack for like $19.99 and they sell like two CDs and some swag stuff, right? I think it was like stickers and stuff. So I buy this. Well, the name McKnight sticks out. You know what I mean? It's, it's, not, it's not the most common, it's not Smith. So apparently he saw this, right? He saw this purchase come through, you know, goes out, goes to my house. A couple of weeks later, he calls me and he's like, hey, I saw you buy some, I bought some CDs. You know, hey man, we're friends. You don't have to buy any CDs. He's like, I'm going to send you like a, a CD of like all my major artists, right? So I told him, I go, yeah, um, his name's Joe. I go, Joe, I, I don't own a CD player, like at all. I don't have, I have all Macs. They don't have CD drives. I said, I don't have a CD player in the house. I don't have a DVD player in the house. The car, I, my wife's car, no CD player. They don't put them in the new cars. And he goes, why'd you buy CDs? And I go, oh, cause I was drinking and I was thinking about how screwed this band's getting me listening to them on Spotify. And I thought, well, maybe I could tip them somehow by buying some of their merch and music because it would be, and I told him, I said, I don't know why, but Spotify and all these other platforms haven't learned that, like you said, their virtual tip jar would be the greatest thing ever. I would love on Spotify, if I could click a button, even if those quote unquote bastards got 10 or 20% of it, I would like it after I heard a song, if I can go, sure, why don't I throw five, 10 bucks at an artist? You know what I mean? Cause I know they made 0.8 cents on the stream. That's if that. giving, yeah, if that, right. Yeah, you can't, you know, the sad thing about that is you, no matter how stupid of a low number you try to come up with, it's not close. Isn't that funny? Um, but the virtual tip jar would be great. I don't know if Spotify would do it, and uh, and they would probably take a lot of it. Oh, they but, would. Yeah. You you just brought up something that could be cool if musicians would uh, just let people know on their website that they have a virtual tip jar. If you go, if you're listening to their music all week and you enjoy it. Tip, tip them something, anything. Right. Doesn't have to be a whole lot. Just some, it all adds up. But um, it's better than the point eight four eight cents point. Well, <laughs> you know, because you do, you know, you do uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube and stuff, and people still. I, I I constantly can't understand this. People don't understand. You can make uh, content like you. You can live stream your music on those platforms, and somebody will super chat you five bucks. And that's more than you'd make if you got 10,000 views. And then they kind of like, they don't understand, you know, <laughs> like you, like kind of like the Spotify joke, how little the, it takes to make pennies. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, but this goes back to this conversation of 
how musicians need to, like you, adapt. You were one of the first ones I noticed adapting in the way that I thought was the smartest, which is you didn't go, okay, I'm not going to play out anymore. I'm not going to travel anymore. In fact, you travel more than probably most people I know. You play out more than most people I know, but you also marriage that to social media. It's, you know, um, for me, I, I, you know, my first record came out in 1990 and I watched a record company have a, a marketing team, a radio promo, promo team, the argument about the video, they wanted to spend $18,000 to do my, to do my, uh, a music video when my budget for the first record was $18,000. And I would have been responsible for half of the budget for the video. And back then there was no outlet. You know, it would have been played, my, my family would have seen it. It would have been played maybe in a dark bar or a public access TV show. That's about it. Um, now we have the ability to market, to find an audience that's into whatever style of music you play, there's an audience for it. Uh, to, if you make a video, there's an outlet for it. You can put it on YouTube, you can let people know. Um, but there is a video, an outlet for a video, whether you spend $5 on making a video or $5,000 on making a video or $50,000 on making a video, there's an outlet for it. Um, there's a way to let people know that your music is there. Why would you not use it? You know, Absolutely. it's these are all tools to help your career. If you're waiting for someone to do that for you, good luck. Um, when you were signed to, if you were signed to major labels in the 80s, 90s, uh, even early 2000s, um, it definitely, it takes a team. It always takes, it takes a team. But those teams, those record company teams, look at your product as just a product. And if it's not meeting expectations after 13 weeks, they have to start working on something else. So when it's your product and you're in control of it, then there is no 13 weeks. You're working on that if you're smart for the rest of your life. You know, it's, it's you're making content that should hold value for the rest of your life that you should be proud and should be working on. It's like, um, imagine if you if you spent the time, I watch your show, as you know, sometimes I try to chime in, it's a lot of times I just have it on and I'm listening and, and I kind of go, what, what did he just say? What? Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, uh, if you worked on your show, how many hours it takes to put on your show, and then you put it up and YouTube after 13 weeks go, hey, Phil, you only got 8,000 views on that, so we're going to pull it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, but it stays up and you, you know, something you work on this, this week, it's 8,000 views by Wednesday and then nothing. And then two years later, it's super relevant for whatever reason if someone discovers it and it's got 100,000 views or 200,000 views or 300,000 views two years later um, because you still kept work, you know, you, you worked on it and put it out there. And occasionally someone sees it or you keep you, you promote yourself. So people go, let me check out what else Phil has done. And they go, oh, this is this is great video. It's perfect for me. Uh, again, I'm not sure about it's It's early and I should have more coffee. Um, <laughs> but um, so as a, as a musician, if you're, you have to kind of look at things as like, what am I trying to do? Why am I trying to do it? And how is the best way to do it? And then you have to go, what are the tools that are going to help me do it? So there are all these, it doesn't cost anything to put a poster, a picture up on you on, on Instagram or a video. Um, it doesn't cost anything for you to put something up on YouTube once you have it. So um and i'm trying to get better at it i mean i have i have really good no matter how hard i work and 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 uh how things go and well how well things go i have friends that are always way better at it that have always this has been going back to the 80s and stuff that keep me in check i think i'm doing a good job and i remember you got you sent me a text and goes hey you should put you should edit some of your live streams and put them up on instagram I'm like oh crap that's a great idea all right, now I got have time for to do that, and I try and do it as much as as often as I can. And I thank you for that. I have other friends that call me and tell me you should be doing this. I'm like, oh, cool, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna squeeze that in, you know. <laughs> but uh, and I'm doing, I'm editing on a flight. I'm editing at the wait, you know, useless time at an airport. Um, I tell, I have advice. I tell artists that I produce about getting radio play, about getting internet radio play, and some follow it, some don't. The ones that follow it do it really well. 
Um, I try and follow it myself. I'm trying to work on it and it, and it, it definitely helps. They're all tools and we have these tools that like this unprecedented, the amount of, uh, of things that we can, we can use, have at our disposal that doesn't cost anything to help promote our own music. So I'm always blown away when I meet a musician who goes, ah, I don't do that. I don't do any of that social media stuff. And can you tell me how, how, how can I get my records heard? How can I get my video? I was like, well, uh, you don't do any of that social media stuff. All right. I, I, I really don't know. Get a record deal, I guess. Yeah. And give them, you know, I don't know if you, while you're at it, look up what a 360 deal is and see if you still want to do that. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is uh, you are, um, I always say this when I go, okay, like everybody, the first thing they say about you is you have a Grammy. So for producing, right? And obviously you're a very talented guitar player. Um, what's funny about that is that's the cachet thing to say about you. You know what I mean? That's because that's those are achievements and they're cool. To me, uh, whenever I discuss you with anyone, what I bring up is you ever meet a guy who won't say no to a job, even if it's not below him? That's Larry. Like he'll, what I love is, you know, play, play at a clinic with Steve I. Yes. Make an album with a band. Yes. Produce a band. Yes. Make my own album. Yes. Do a live stream. Yes. Play a show anywhere. Yes. I always use you as the perfect example of if you want to see what yeses get you, you got to watch Larry because he's, you, you know, people, especially who don't do what you do have no concept of how hard it is to be relevant, keep relevant, you know, in any way. Um, perfect example, uh, in your endorsement list, here you are playing your signature guitar. I think they're what, six, $7,000? Uh, the, the tier two is five. Oh, okay, well, let's see, <laughs> only five. So yeah. five, but- Tier one if you want, uh, but the- uh... Yeah. And, and, and here's what's, a, here's, what's perfect about that. You, you play the ax effects, you demo ax effects, you use ax effects, but also, you know, you promote like hot one, you know, right. Which is uh, an inexpensive line of effects. Th that, wait, 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 hold on a second. I, I got to go back to one of your videos at now. Is that how you pronounce it? Is that how they pronounce it? Yeah. It, yeah. It's hot one. Okay. Yeah. Right, that, cool. Yeah. Yeah. When I asked them, uh, he, I said, is it Hotone or hot one? They said it's hot one. Okay, cool. Um, that is the official way they said you have to, you know, they say it. Um, <laughs> but I did a whole damn show demoing the demoing this stuff, and I kept calling it hotel. <laughs> you know everybody. what? They, <laughs> they, well, because you know what's funny was um, when I went to the booth of you, uh, when I talked to them, they didn't have anyone that spoke English strong enough to even answer the question. Uh, so yeah. we did that thing you do when you, two people that don't speak the same language, I would say things. And then when I said it right, they nodded. So in the video that they're the only brand in that video that doesn't say their name officially, I say it. He just nods when I say it. <laughs> so, okay. but, but see, see what I'm saying? That's a perfect example of you, you, I think, and you, you know, I want you to kind of expand on this. Um, I think you see, I don't think you try to size up an opportunity. I think you're just used to doing things and then seeing what opportunities come from those things. That seems I, like, you see what I'm saying? And this is important because like we said, in the future now, you know, um, those are the attitudes you're going to have to adopt. People are going to have to adopt a little bit of the Larry Mitchell philosophy of, hey, see, you're laughing, but it's it's true because because here's, that is just a part of the, you know, of, of the changes I think we're going to be seeing in the next decade or two in music. Um, so I guess what I'm asking you is, could you expand on how you, how do you, how do you see an opportunity? When somebody talks to you, how do you decide what's an opportunity for you and what's not? How does your brain process this? Hmm. A lot of times, there's a lot of ways that uh, a lot of times you can't see. You can't see the future. You can't totally see how it's going to benefit you all the way. You can't totally see it. Um, but I have to see a little bit of benefit or if it's really going to help someone else. 
Um, now I say yes a lot uh, in order to keep my sanity and my happiness. Um, about 20 years ago, I started to, to make sure that I really, I don't do things that I don't, I don't really enjoy. Um, I produce other artists. I do not produce an artist just because of talent alone. I have produced artists that are, that are, are, that are very talented, but they're nice people. I produce artists that are not in any way near as talented, but they're nice people. I have referred people very talented to other friends, but they're not on my list of really enjoyable people to be in a room with. But you know, I got I have friends that can deal with that and aren't even thinking about that, and they need the money. So yeah, be my guest and stuff like that. Um, I don't do products that I don't I don't like. So all the endorsements are stuff that I really that resonate with me for some reason. So even you know the hot one, uh, the pedals I like uh, a lot of the little pedals for us. I like uh, the Impero one. Um, it's interesting. I've always looked for a, ba a small backup for my fractal. The fractal's the number one. I own a, a, a Helix HX Stomp. It's a great pedal. Uh, that's a backup for a while. It's in Texas now with a friend of mine. Um, but the fractal is my main thing. I just needed to travel with something as well that I could put in. It's not going to uh, drag me down as far as like, you know, carrying stuff as a backup. I'm not touring the way, you know, like I did with Tracy Chapman, where I brought like a ton of guitars and backups of everything and stuff like that. I am, you know, I'm checking in, checking in an airport with two suitcases and one guitar I carry on and one pedal board with uh, one bag with a pedal board in it. Um, uh, and that's me. And someone's picked me up and sometimes at an airport in, in a small car, <laughs> not a huge van or something like that. When I go on the road with a van in a van, that's a different thing, different situations. Uh, so I don't really gravitate towards, uh, I don't work with companies or products that I, that I don't resonate with me at all. But everything else, um, if there's like, if the people are cool, I will investigate and see if it's something for me, if it's something that I can use. I do a lot of different things. I play a lot of types of music. I produce, I play, I play bass, I play drums, play a little bit, of, very little bit of keyboards, but I play no records. So there's, a, and then I have a studio. So there's lots of gear that ends up uh, with me that I like. And when it's something I really like, I want to tell everybody about it. And if a company is having me endorse it that way, that's great. If they're not, I still share it. Um, I still work with, you know, stuff. And a lot of times, uh, I've been turned down for an endorsement, and then later on they come back to me and go, "Hey, you're you're using our stuff." I like, yeah, I sent you a whole email while I was using your stuff. I met you in person, uh, and they go, "Oh yeah, yeah," and then they put it together, and and that works, stuff like that. Uh, as far as gig wise, um, I've some of the biggest things I've gotten have come from gigs that a lot of people were turned down, uh, situations that don't. And uh, and not for a reason of like, oh, this is just a horrible, you know, place to play, whatever. It's just that just a, it was too small or some of the weird situation. Um, and then you might see the benefit from it uh, immediately or years, years later. I have definitely done some gigs that I go, oh, I don't know if that was really a, I think that was might have been a waste of time. And then years later, someone goes, hey, I'm glad we could get you. We've been working on bringing you to this country. Blah, blah, blah. I saw you play at this small bar, <laughs> you know, at a, at a place once and uh, years ago, and we've been trying to get you here for for every sense. And I'm like, you were at that gig? You were one of the six people at that show? Oh, yeah, yeah, we were just in town and we saw that. And, you know, you, wouldn't want, you know. so, um, and there was no reason to not do that gig. Uh, it's just that it just ended up being like, it just wasn't one of the most thrilling, exciting gigs at the time. But right. it paid off years later. I, I can't tell you many things like that, many situations like that. If, you know, takes up time. But um, so yeah, I uh, there are lots of things that are that are again, everything is a tool. Um, uh, sometimes I have friends that don't gig as much or don't do a lot of things because they're looking for immediate gratification as to what is this going to get me. This is not going to pay me X amount of dollars right now. 
this is not going to this is not being broadcast on on, on uh, major television so why should i do this right now and it's like uh okay <laughs> I, I don't have an answer for that uh you know i would do it but i i, don't know. I, I think you do have an answer it's funny it's funny interviewing you because you know we've been friends and we've talked what's funny about they, they you play on stage together yeah yeah I think, well what's interesting well there's a lot of interesting things about you what's interesting about you that i've observed over the years is in fact everything you just said just now kind of cu- cu- encompasses this idea i look at you as someone who looks at investing in themselves not investing in an idea that they think turns into something that turns into something. You know what I mean? And uh, I've used your, I don't want to say your model, but your philosophy, whether or not you, you, because, you know, really, to be honest with you, I know I'm getting sidetracked here, but really to be honest with you, people live their philosophy. They don't say it. You know what I mean? People who tell me their philosophy, that's great. But people really live their own philosophy. You don't need to ask somebody what they're, you know, what they believe. They, it just oozes out of them. (laughs) Watching you, that became apparent. Your philosophy is you invest in yourself. And, and like you said earlier, in the people you like and the people you enjoy in the things you enjoy. uh, And not so much like investing into some kind of concept of opportunity. Right. Um, And, uh, and I like that because what I learned about watching you was that is that you're always busy. Like every, you know, you mean you're, I, I talk to a lot of musicians. A lot of musicians are not busy, right? A lot of musicians are in, in limbo of between project. Especially right the last two years. I have a lot of friends that are still not back to work, not, not working right now. Yeah. Well, here's what's funny about this. Uh, you know, one of the questions I hate that I get asked is, hey, how was, you know, since COVID, yeah, what, you know, what's going on? And I'm like, well, in my world, COVID changes nothing. I was already trapped in a room all day. Now I'm just trapped in a room all day. Apparently everybody in my neighborhood's trapped in their rooms with me, but I didn't, you know, what, it, and musicians immediately had to flock to that concept of what you were, like I said, what you were already doing. You know, uh, and you did it, you did it in, in the funniest way. I remember like my, my, my favorite example of this is you went and did uh, remember when you did the, um, for Alice Cooper's, uh, Alice Cooper has a teen center. He opened a second one, by the way. I uh, saw it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Alice Cooper for the audiences know Alice Cooper in Mesa, Arizona has a teen center where they, uh, a bunch of rich people invest into a very beautiful facility, um, so and yeah it's off the charts and they allow children between 12 and i think 20 to just go like that's it all you have to do to go there is be 12 to 20 years old and you have access to art classes recording studios gear that we all dream to own lessons you name it larry went and did it did a clinic a class for the, for the kids and it was a tuesday right remember this and then immediately after doing the class you're you were you asked them politely hey can i stick around for like an hour and do my live stream and be, and then after that me and you went to dinner and what i remember about that was just because you were doing this thing just because you weren't at home just because all these other factors you know and your your schedule was already compressed you still went no no this is this other thing i do right and you continue to do that. I've seen you do those streams from airports, <laughs> the airport terminals. And what's funny about that is where no one was really noticing that before, they're noticing it now because they, you were doing that without a COVID, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and like I said, I think that's, I think, believe it or not, I really believe you'll get more, te- you'll be templated more and more people will look at how you've been at, how you've been acting and doing for the last couple of years to see how they can do more of this maybe maybe um consistency is a big thing uh and uh it's odd that in a in something like with music where people at some point should have been practicing consistently <laughs> Uh, have a hard time doing certain, a lot of things consistently. So once I started doing it and uh, on Tuesday nights, that locked it in. Um, 
I travel a lot. When I was traveling, I travel a lot on Tuesdays because there's no shows really. And so I was like, I have to start booking flights around that to get in in time to go do my show. Uh, my favorite is when I landed early, early in the morning in Australia in 2019. And um, I had to go pick up, borrow a fractal AX8 anyway. And so I asked the guy uh, from the, the fractal distributor if I could do my show from their office. And he was just like, you just got off a plane. I got, yeah, I got to do it. Because that 10.30 in the morning was 9 o'clock at night or something like that. 10 o'clock in the morning was 9 o'clock at night, which is my normal time. So I had to do it there. So I did it in the morning. And then I, I mean, I, I fell asleep in the office there afterwards. Yeah. Uh, consistency. There are people that rely on it. People know that they can tune in. It's just like watching TV shows when we were kids, Saturday morning cartoons or Saturday morning Kung Fu. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you didn't always make it, but if you were there and you turned it on and it wasn't, you were really upset. Yeah. You know, yeah. So well, I had to do that. Um, and then uh, as far as COVID changing things, what it changed for me was it gave me a chance to slow down um because 2019 i was home 60 days uh period um it to give me a chance to slow down and work not, on some not, stuff. not to cut you off not in a row though let's be clear no not in a row <laughs> yeah yeah just accumulatively total 60 days for the entire year spread out. yeah um i was extremely creative during during covid time during, during 20 last year 2020 uh i released two new records of my own which i got i forgot to send you files um and then I also was, wor was working on two different artists, singer songwriters that I produced, Katie Martin and Gina Karen. And both we were very close to finishing their records. And then COVID hit, and you know, uh, we had to continue like nine, uh, six months later or seven months later. Um, so I was able to finish their stuff, work on it some more, work on finish, uh, do and finish two of my records, um, work on my my uh live streaming thing uh work in the studio do different things like everybody had time to do stuff but really i kept doing things i did go out and do some big shows that were uh that were um uh, socially distanced in really you know really big places uh i did some live streams for for the kennedy center for for a couple of universities for the state of new mexico for a bunch of places um so i kept working i kept doing things um and I kept getting calls from friends that saying, hey, how are you doing this? I'm not doing anything. There's no work or whatever. And okay, I don't know. I just, I do a lot of different things. And, and um, I'm just trying to catch up, you know, still doing stuff. So staying, COVID didn't, it didn't really change a whole lot. It just made me uh, focus a lot more on certain things. And I still kept traveling. And uh, once I got the vaccine, I, I did travel quite a bit. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, but yeah, consistency, I have to do. Um, as far as the shows, I added a second show, a Sunday night acoustic live stream, which is all acoustic, all mellow. And uh, I have a core following of people that tune in every week to both shows. And then another core following of people who only watch on Tuesdays and some that only watch on Sundays. And uh, which is great. So I want to make sure that I can do that. A couple of times I had to not do the Sunday show or I had to cancel it. Um, I mean, I have to do it earlier or later because of traveling or the show conflicts. But I still try and always do it. Um, I guess I could tape it, but the part of the whole thing is just being live there with people, people like that. Like your Friday show when people like to ask questions, they like to be there at the moment you do it. Um, yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's well, it's funny is uh things that like i said you have things you've learned that like i said musicians will soon be learning um i know these things you know these things this is what's funny in my world i do the podcast and then i'll do you know youtube videos reviews and then i do how to youtube videos and then i repair guitars right and i make pickups and i do these other things like you i lots of little ways to make a penny so that it collects collectively makes a dollar right yeah. but yes. <laughs> But here's what's funny about this. Sure. Do you have a few people who really connect with you? And I, I don't know what you would want to call them, super fans or followers, or you know, maybe just your community is a, a good enough word. That's a small, small piece. 
Then the crazy part that musicians for some reason have a block, a mental block with, which is exactly what you're saying. I have people that could, and it's happened to me so many times now, they don't know what I look like. They just listen to the podcast and, yeah. and they'll hear my voice and they're like, oh, do you do a podcast? And I'm like, yeah. And, and then people who watch my videos, they could care less to listen to me talk for two hours. And like you said, somebody who on Friday at three was can't wait to be there to talk and interact and ask questions, but literally probably won't watch or do another thing that has to do with me at all. I have people who I do repairs for, and they're like, oh, you do YouTube? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> because you know, i'll tell them i'm busy this week you know and they doing what i'm like oh, i gotta make some videos oh you make videos and that's the that's the lesson uh like you said with your sunday show and your tuesday show to the to the not the amateur i don't want to say that to the novice to the person who doesn't know what they're looking at they're just looking at you trying to expand an audience like your tuesday audience i'll give them even more on sunday now they get twice as much larry mitchell but it's really, like you said, somebody out there is not going to watch you on Tuesday because Tuesday night there's a game or something that rates over you somehow. But once you opened up Sunday, oh, Sunday, they got nothing to do. Or vice versa. None of your football fans are watching you <laughs> on Sunday. They're going to watch the Tuesday show. Yeah. yeah. And some people aren't going to watch the internet they're gonna they go live they support live you know yeah sure yeah and and vice versa and you know internet people some people won't go outside <laughs> I, I think what you and i have are uh good survival skills and life skills so um uh, it's just like i think you and i had a conversation about just music in general i listen to music there's two types of music i don't listen to um and uh uh, or rarely listen to, I should say. Um, but everything else I listen to and enjoy, and those two types of music I don't produce at all. I don't care how cool I know the person or whatever, how great or whatever. I just think, yeah, you got the wrong person for me for, for that. But um, you can, in life skills, if you, if or life skills as a musician, if you go, I play guitar, I only play this brand of rock. Uh, I'm not learning any country licks. I'm not learning anything else. Um, uh, I'm not interested in how drums work. I'm not interested in how keyboard chords work. Uh, I, you know, I'm just playing guitar. Someone else has to record me. Someone else has to, to set up all of my stuff. Um, then if you can, uh, if you grew up like Michael Jackson, then you could probably do that. Although Michael was many multifaceted. Uh, otherwise, when you're not able to play guitar, you're everything stops. Everything stops. So uh, you know, I learned how to everything. I didn't. I didn't go out and learn a, a lot of different things or do all the stuff um, overnight. Everything came out of necessity of. Uh, a wall gets put up in front of you and you go, you don't go, ooh, there's a wall there. I'm going to sit here and, and just look at this wall because I can't do anything else. I can't go forward. A wall comes, you go, hmm, that wall's not that high. How do I climb over it? Oh, maybe I could go around it. Or, you know, should, should I drill through the wall? What, you know, it's just a, a temporary stop. So when my, after my second record came out, uh, in 1993, I think it was, uh, and I didn't want to sign another record deal. I had been on five labels and just did not like the music business. A friend of mine gave me the keys to his house and said, "Make you need to make a record. And I got, I don't have the money to make a record because you, you couldn't make a record on your iPhone like you can now. Um, you, know, you need a lot of gear. He had the gear in his basement. He goes, here, you put it together, you use it. And I went in his basement and I sat there and go, I don't really know how to do this stuff. I started making the phone calls. And I learned and I made uh, an awful electric record and a great acoustic record, just the way it worked out. <laughs> uh, I didn't release that electric record and I released an acoustic record because it sounded good, even though it wasn't what I normally do. And that led a, a whole, that opened up a whole different career for me. And also I didn't realize it, but I was learning all the recording stuff um, taught me that, oh, I don't have to ever worry about like a, a record company again or going to a studio. I like studios, but I can do this. It taught me that I could do this myself. 
and I was going to get better at it. So I got some recording gear. I'd start doing that. And then other artists, other musicians were going, oh, you have studio gear? Could you record me? And then, and then I later started producing. And that led to a completely different career. Right. Uh, uh, the live streaming was a necessity out of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not home that much in Opelika. Somebody in Opelika contacted me on a Tuesday, on a Monday, and said, hey, could you play a restaurant tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, I don't really play much. At home, when I'm here, I play one venue, Eighth and Rail. And, um, but uh, tell me about the restaurant. Why? You know, I was looking for a reason to do it. It was a Tuesday night. And the amount of money they offered me was not just the, not insulting for, for the position I am, but insulting as if, if I only played in town once a month, I found that amount of money insulting. I go, really? You're calling me that? You, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, I said, I, I think I'm going to do a Facebook Live. And that was the first Facebook Live, because I've, I've, I would rather play to two people on Facebook streaming and it stayed up than to play at this restaurant for the amount of money that they offered me to do. And the way they said it, if he had said, look, this is all we have, it would be great, blah, blah, blah. So, and I was trying to give them reasons to make it uh, seem like a good thing to do. But the way that he spoke to me on the phone, it was like, remember I said, I don't do things I don't really want to do, I don't like to do, or the, the person. So it made no, I couldn't find a justifiable reason. It wasn't just the money. It wasn't just the attitude on the phone. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was just a lot of things about that phone call. But when down on the phone call, I was like, yeah, I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a Facebook Live. And that was the start. I was like, it, it was more beneficial for me to do the Facebook Live that that time. Um, I didn't know anything about Facebook Live. I just heard about it. And he took my phone and I did it. And I was like, and I got a group of more than more than two people watching. It was a good response. I said, all right, I'll do it next week. And then I started looking at, you know, it just, it blossomed into that. The recording, my own record blossomed into producing other people, which is what led me to having a Grammy and a bunch of other stuff for producing and engineering. Um, the streaming, uh, I can't tell you the benefit, all the benefits from streaming have been amazing for me. Um, and everything else that I do has been like, out of a, a somewhat a necessity is like, all right, I need to figure out how to do that. How do I do it? All right, I'm going to dive in and, and it's just been a ne necessary thing. They're all tools. Well, you, perfect example, two perfect examples for you. Uh, one, uh, perfect example of what I said earlier about you, you seem to value, uh, you know, investing in yourself. That Facebook Live, perfect example of that. You could have got, look, you work for free versus working for what felt like undervalue. Exactly. And it, it wasn't even just the money. The money was insulting. Right. I mean, you know, anybody else that I, the people I know here that play out, it was like, oh yeah, I wouldn't have that. But it's the way he spoke on the phone. And uh, oh, that, that restaurant's no longer in business, by the way. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah. Um, yeah, if 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 he if it was if the money if if way you approached me about the money it would have been like a different way I would have been like oh, yeah it's not, a, not it's three mile drive I'll just go down and and do it and stuff like that but and I gave him many opportunities to to say anything nice or right on the phone and uh, it just didn't work just didn't right. Happen. but um, right now speaking of investing in yourself everything's about branding. So we're not doing any one thing for one thing. It is you. It is your name, your reputation, your your brand. So, because people, when they get into what you're doing, they hit the subscribe button. They subscribe mm -hmm. in life. They go, all right, you know, what's? Let me check and see what this this person is up to, what they're doing. Um, you have to invest in yourself, in 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 your brand in many different ways and learning different things to bring into your tool chest, your arsenal, uh, keeps you from being bored, keeps you working when one thing shuts down. There are years where um, gigging didn't work for me, uh, and but, uh, but uh, production did. Um, in fact, when I lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico, I played as a sideman for other people, but I did 14 of my shows in 10 years, 
14. That's that's like a week, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, a 14 of my shows in, in 10 years. Uh, but I produced a lot of stuff. I have um, uh, I have a, 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 a a bit of New Mexico Music Awards for production engineering in that time period, um, quite a bit. And then I needed to seek out balance. And so I started doing a bunch of things. And then when I moved to Alabama, I got a band, a trio, and we started traveling in a van, which is something I hadn't done during, especially in the South and my stuff. And production took us a, a, a big sidestep. So it's always been like, well, trying to have a balance, but sometimes like uh, like last year when gigs slowed down, I did a lot more production, more studio stuff. Um, and sometimes uh, studio the studio will completely sh slow down and it's all about live things. So uh, just having those and uh, just having those available now, uh, just having the option is a, it's, it's just a good thing. It's, and uh, I, I can't see just going, well, I just play guitar. I only play my music. Um, which I do really open my music, but I play as a sideman. I have a gig tomorrow night. I have to leave after this to drive to Nashville to play with Randy Driscoll, who's an artist I produce. But I'm playing as a sideman with her and also doing a, a short set of my own tomorrow night. But I still do sideman stuff. I still do clinics. Um, uh, two months ago, I mixed an opera for the first time, which I didn't know how to do. I had to Google where the instruments go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I just got back from working on a soundtrack for a film score for a Native American film with a, an artist that I've done lots of projects with, Don Avery. Um, it's always something different, but that's production. Then one was just engineering. Um, tomorrow's a sideman gig. Uh, um, next week, I'm, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. I have a couple of house concerts, and then I'm doing the, the Portland Guitar Festival, the Rose Quarter Guitar Festival. Uh, as me, for me, right. and then I come back and I think I have another sideman gig. I have to look at that. So I do a lot of different things, and it's over the years uh, you work at. Um, I'm open to doing a lot of things. Uh, I'm not closed off to doing a lot of things. There has to be a reason. There has to be more of a reason why I wouldn't do something than there is of why I should do something. Uh, does that make sense? Sure, sure. Well, like I said, if there's one carryover from all of this is when I listen to you explain all these things again, uh, you, like the opera, right? You said, Hey, I'm, I'm producing an opera and now I got to learn how to do this again, back to this theme. Uh, that's an investment in yourself. Now you have that knowledge. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, I'm going to take on this task. You know, it's funny. We, you, I, I, like you said, I, maybe that's why we gravitate and we like to talk to each other. We we're both friends with Larry DiMarzio. As you know, you're an artist, signature artist for him. Yeah. Larry, the first conversation I ever had Larry, that made me laugh was when he talked about how he took up photography because he's like, oh, they wanted a fortune for advertising and I didn't have the money. So I just started to learn how to take pictures of my products. He's and, great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a fanta fantastic photographer. That's the whole point, though, right? It's it's his brain said, like your brain said, I could find somebody, pay them something to do this, or I could learn this put the time and energy into myself. And I'm, I think seriously, uh, in a world where you get, I, we can't even come up with the number now I'm from Spotify, 0. 0.000 nothing on Spotify. Uh, YouTube pays, you know, 10 cents, a thousand views or whatever. These are important avenues, but this idea, um, and I think uh, that's one thing we have kindred, uh, in aligned to each other, it's something we have in common. You know, people see, for some reason, they see Van Halen as a successful guitar player, and then everything else is failure for some reason. There's so many people that have this viewpoint, right? You're, I call it uh, top ramen to Lamborghinis, right? Musicians either eat top ramen or they drive a Lamborghini, right? And I'm like, no, there's so much in between, right? YouTube has unfortunately turned into that same environment. They see, oh, if you either, either get 6 million views or it doesn't matter on your platform. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like that's, none of this is great for, we're super excited for those that can do it. For the Eddie Van Halens and the, you know, and all the ones that succeed, I'm, I'm so happy for them. However, I don't want musicians to think 
that way that I got to make it or I don't make it. And the reality is, no, you can make a living, have a great life, meet great people, have integrity, enjoy yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to sum up what is what is uh, success for you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I can also, in that light, I am far less disappointed than a lot of friends that I have. I, okay, explain that. Because you know what? I... I would love to hear what you mean by that. Um, so again, I tend not to do, I tend not to work with people who are uh, uh, not extremely nice. <laughs> not <laughs> so that is less, you know, every artist that I work with uh, for production, I go, let's have a little uh, get together trial thing. Let's work for four hours, see if we can work in the same room together. And uh, that has been very helpful because uh, work on a record is pretty intimate and you're alone with somebody and you need to see if, if they are going to be over your shoulder uh, every second or if they're, and they need to see how you work as well. Um, I try to do gigs or things for the right reasons. I try not to do things that uh, just don't make any sense at all. I have to, again, I have to figure it out. All right, so what's the deal with this? And then uh, I'm not looking too hard for a reason not to do it, but if something glares out at me, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna do it. Um, I am working and doing stuff. If, um, if there's a gig that I wanna do and they're not interested, I'm not gonna sulk about it. There are other places where I can go play that they are happy. In fact, I made a, a decision about four years ago to to basically do where go where I want it. Um, I, I there's there's funny stories I could tell you about uh, trying to get knocking knocking my head on the, against the door, trying to get into a specific specific uh, um, show to send in the promoter. Uh, video links and mp3s and bio and press stuff and not getting a response at all to someone handing me the phone number i call and and you could hear them go oh 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 yeah uh and like they didn't really want to mean to answer the phone and then and um them telling me why it wouldn't work um only for me to go but it's a jazz night isn't it because there's no uh, or them telling me that it wouldn't work because it's instrumental and i go but you you have all jazz acts right so i mean it also vocal have vocals oh well only one but um it's just i'm not sure it's gonna work and then and then you stop and you hear them you hear typing and then uh all of a sudden you hear um a, my, i could hear my one of my videos on youtube playing and then the next thing is what sent me over it's like Hey, did you used to play the East Village back in the in the in the late '80s, early '90s? I'm like, yeah, I used to play Kenny's Castaways, Bitter End, Terror Blues. Dude, me and my friends went to went to college at NYU. We used to come see you play all the time. You should play our. And I'm like, are you serious? Are you serious? I've been sending you video links forever. You just never looked at it, or what? Now a YouTube video makes you remember that you used to come see me play, and now I'm right for your for the event, the thing that I've been trying to get you to do for like three years. So. I'm done knocking my head against the wall. I am open to playing where people want me to play. And uh, I will still try if something's really good. I go, hey, I would love to play this. And if they say no, then it's like, okay, no, no problem. I'm not frustrated by it. I'm not, I'm no longer frustrated by stuff like that. Um, I don't have a grudge against stuff like that. I'm just surprised. I, I'm not as surprised anymore, I should say. Um, and then uh, I'm not surprised or, or upset when there's a piece of gear that I uh, reach out to a company about um, either give me a discount or whatever, or if it's something that I really feel strong, I want to endorse and they're not interested. It just, it happens. I have friends that get upset about that. I have friends, people yeah. that yeah. contact me, I shouldn't say just friends with acquaintances that contact me go, hey, how do I get an endorsement with Fractal? Like, and I have to go, well, what are you doing? 
<laughs> they're not doing anything. And then they get upset because they're not getting an endorsement. It's like, you know, you could be the great, best player in the world, but if no one knows about you, if you're not doing anything, it doesn't help the company at all. Um, so I play guitar, people watch, people come see me play live, people buy my music. Uh, I have a model that's amazing, made by one of the best luthiers in the period, I think. And, uh, and people are buying the guitar. I, I, there's, you know, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not as disappointed. I'm not disappointed like a lot of people I know or friends in music that feel they're entitled to this. They're entitled to a guitar endorsement. Or, uh, I've been at companies, I was at Ibanez for 26 years. I watched people leave because they weren't getting treated like they were Steve Vai or Jose Adriani or Paul Gilbert. And it's like, but you're not either one of those, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, but, you may be able, you may think you're on the same playing level, but you're not where they are success level, you know, or you're you're not doing uh I, oh here's another example. Um I you know things in, in endorsement things kind of shifted and you could even have uh be playing out live and being in front of people, but there's someone who only plays in a bedroom and they have, you know, a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube, they can get an endorsement faster than you can. Yeah. And so I have friends that are like, but they're not gigging and they're not doing anything. Well, but they're doing something. <laughs> they got a hundred thousand people that subscribe to their thing. They're doing something. The people, the, you know, it's, and that's valuable to the company. Uh, what I was talking about when friends say, well, you know, how come I want to get a NAGS endorsement? Um, they're not, they're not, someone that has 100,000 subscribers on anything. They're not doing YouTube, or they're not doing social media that well. Uh, they're not playing gigs. They're not, they don't have a music school where they're, where they're teaching a thousand kids a week. Uh, they're not, they really literally have nothing but an expertise on their instrument, but no one knows they have an expertise on the instrument. So, I'm sorry, you were about to say something. No, no, I, I agree with you. I. I have learned, I've learned uh, when it comes to the sponsorship endorsement gig thing, I got a cool, as a, a YouTube entity that hangs out with professional musicians, right? It's like, to me, is a YouTuber hanging out with you or when I get to hang out with real musicians, which I like to call real musicians, it's like when you watch the Kardashians hang out with real movie stars and you and the, you, it's that moment you realize like, like this stuff is crossing over in the weirdest way, right? But it's the same kind of thought process. But what I've learned from that is companies, when it comes to endorsements, you know, giving endorsements, to, bear, to, to boil it down to just the simple concept, they care about one of two things. Your audience, which the majority of them follow that. So... Which is why Kurt Cobain, which I love Kurt Cobain, but Kurt Cobain has the same power as, let's say, Steve I. I wouldn't put them in the same realm as guitar technique, but they both, to the companies, yes. bring these audiences that the, that's what they care about. They care about the audience. So that's one thing. The other thing is, if it's not the audience, then they care about you as the way you play or your talent because your talent becomes the exhibition of their instrument. You can make their product sound better than it is, right? I mean, let's. I, my joke is Fender didn't sell a single Strat, Jimi Hendrix did, you know what I mean? I mean, that's who sells the Strats, you know, Hendrix, Clapton, they sell Strats. Mm -hmm. um, and I find when I'm talking to, like you said, when we talk to artists that are not getting it, they don't understand. you. You have to master one of those things. You either need to bring them an audience that they can sell to, because that's what they care about, or you got to bring them something that says, me plus your product equals better than you were already before. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and what's great is, but the, or not what's great, what's most important though, is figuring out when you're talking to them, which one of those two things they care about, because they don't necessarily care about both. Right. You know what I mean? Sure. I, I deal with companies and that's exactly, uh, it's as simple as uh, if you have a hundred thousand subscribers, you have a value. And if you have 101, you have more value. 
right? I mean, that's, that's the value system. And I have some companies that I've talked to and I've interacted with and I've learned from that it doesn't matter how big your audience is, if, it, if, it, if they don't feel that you're increasing the value of the way their product perceived, who cares yeah. if, they, if you can let a lot of people know about it if you don't seem to increase the value of it to them? Um, yeah, or, if, you, or if, you, if they don't want you or want you representing their company, because when you're endorsing, you're representing a company, basically. Right. Sense, you know. Yes. And, um, and that's why, unfortunately, there's this myth <laughs> that only guitar players, it's, I don't even say musicians, just guitar players seem to believe Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this drummer's got it too, but uh, which is that somehow, like you said, they'll chase, let's say their favorite guitar brand. They'll chase that brand forever. Thinking at some point it changes. You know what I mean? That they'll, they'll connect. Meanwhile, they say no to three other opportunities, you know? Um, and I, and like I said, I think like I, and this is a good way to segue when we talk about the last thing, which is your, your signature guitar, because this is something we should talk about. Your signature guitar is, is to me is a perfect example of, it's a, it's a beautiful instrument by Joe Nags and you love it. I do. And, and I really believe that uh, your love of that instrument, your signature guitar, is what I think what they value. I think that's what Nags values. You know what I mean? They know that you're getting, you're, you're showing it to people. They know that, you know, the only way to sell that kind of caliber guitar is to have a caliber player like you playing it. I mean, that's how you got to get people to buy it. Um, however, I don't think that's necessarily the only value they see. I think they just, like I said, they know you have a love of it. And, um, and you know as well as I do in this industry, because there's the, the, the dark underbelly of everything. There are some companies, they could care less if you play their thing as long as every picture you have of it is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, and here's a great example. Uh, and I'm going to share it with you because I just got it the other day. I, I did an interview with Joe, uh, John Petrucci yesterday. Uh -huh. And in the, he said something that was just off the cuff. I don't th even know he realized what he said. So I want to ask you, I'm going to set you up for failure. Okay. I'm going to ask you the question and then let's see if it aligns. So you made two records during COVID, yes. right? Yeah. And what guitar is on those records? Oh, uh, I'm pretty sure every lead is this guitar. Uh -huh. um, I have a, a Nags Kanai that's more like a Les Paul. That's rhythm on a couple of tracks. I do have a... Uh, a R8, a 15 a Gibson 58 Les Paul reissue. Right. Rhythm on a couple of the guitar. I got that guitar specifically for recording. Um, and then uh, my first nags of this model, which has a, a Rosewood fretboard, and it has a, a different has a different vibe about the guitar in general, is on a lot of the rhythm parts as well. Uh, like the main rhythm part, like it would be the main guitar part other than the solo. Um, and I think this is these last two records that are the first two records I've used, I've done in a long time that don't have an actual telly on it. I, I, when I was, as a producer, I learned that there's a spot for a telly on every record. Right. Uh, you can find, you can layer as much and then you go, oh, let me, one more guitar part and you find it, pick up a telly and it's in there for recording. Um, but this has a maple fretboard and it has a bit of telly characteristic, not a true telly characteristic. Um, but I use this guitar in spots where I would have grabbed a telly. So this guitar is very versatile for me because I used it for leads and I used it for what, what would absolutely be considered not lead parts. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that's it. I don't think I used my channel on, on those records. Um, yeah, I think it was just, just, just those. Um, now, now here's what's interesting. This is what ties into what he said. He was saying, cause you know, he plays his music band and like you, you just said basically the same thing he just said. You said, oh, I played all the lead parts. I played this guitar. 
Mm-hmm. What he said was on the new Dream Theater album, on, the, on his albums, actually he didn't even say about the, you know, the new one. He said on his albums, if you want to hear his guitar, they're on his albums. When he said that passingly, I started laughing, thinking about it in my head going, yeah, you know what's funny? Think about how many signature endorsed guitars out there that aren't even on the albums. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and, uh, and then you, you kind of realize it's not that it's, a, I'm not saying there's something negative about that. What I'm saying is, is think of how powerful that statement you just said right now is. Oh, uh, all the leads on the albums are this guitar. Yeah, this is, this is so the guitar. If, so if you want to hear that guitar, buy my album. <laughs> right? I mean, that's not really the point, but that you see what I'm saying? Like, think yeah. about that. And, um, and again, I think, uh, I think that's one thing the internet talk about changing of philosophies and why these conversations are, are going to be important. I think the days of, you know, these fly by night and Dorsey concepts, they're going to the wayside. Um, I had a uh, musician, he's a young musician I interviewed. It's not out, it'll be out in a few months. But in this conversation, I told him something almost like a father would tell a son, where I said, guys like me killed your opportunities for these fat fly by night sponsorship deals. In other words, nobody's going to sponsor an artist that isn't going to actually use the product now, because if you just want somebody to just display product, that's what these YouTube channels have created. Yeah. Constant, constant, like, Hey, these are products I've seen. This is what I do. Right. And, and there's no real connection. You know, no one expects like an, a channel like mine or the channels that are out there, like what I do um, to go every episode to be like, okay, it's still just this one guitar again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and that's why I said those philosophies are going to have to change. You're going to have to learn, sadly enough, to, to like you said, play the guitar that even the, if the company won't sponsor you, you love, and then hope that that connection happens because I, I the companies are going to learn. Like I said, I, that's why I said I we started this whole conversation with what I believe, which is COVID is going to speed up what was already probably coming down the road in the next 10 years, which is a company doesn't need an artist to just hold a guitar for a minute. Yeah. They yeah. need you to make albums with it. They need you to play it. They have influencers or whatever you want to call channels out there to promote. Yep. Like carnival barkers. They'll, they'll, they'll put out the product in front of the audience, but you need people to actually have intimate relations with your, their product in a, in a way like you, like you, where, I can listen to this new album and go, wow, every solo, listen to that, listen to that guitar. Majority of guitar stuff are this guitar. Yeah. Or other guys. Um, just for as a, just a side note, for production, um, you, you should you should use a couple of different sounding guitars. Sh- sure, uh, but and, yeah. Yes. But um, but yeah, this was my main guitar. And I use this every other week on on um on my live stream, a lot, I have, I'm sitting in the, you know, I'm doing my live stream and there's a, I'm surrounded by a bunch of Nags guitars and even my model. And occasionally I'll pick one up for a song, but I always go back to this guitar, you know, cause I, I have a connection stronger with this guitar than with the other guitars. And uh, sometimes it's fun to play different guitars, you know, stuff like that. And there, I, I mean, I'm only playing my Nags and stuff like that, but sometimes I just, I have to play the guitar I'm most connected with to be connected with the music at that moment. Um, but yeah, going back to uh, people not just holding a guitar, when I was with another company, uh, there was a there were two crises. Two, one extremely big artist was uh, did a tour in another company country, and he didn't use their guitar, and he was a it was a big tour. And then there was a guy who uh, has a sig- has another signature model, and he went to do clinics and he didn't have his model guitar with him. So that was a, a you know, he had a, a, a different company's guitar with him. And he's like, oh, no, no, I'm still with the company. I just, this is a guitar I brought out on tour. And he didn't bring any one of his own models. And it's like, you know, dude, it, it, I mean, there's so many things you could say about that, but uh, you're doing a clinic for a company, you don't have their product with you at all, the guitar. Right. So maybe you should rethink that endorsement. <laughs> maybe you should rethink who you who who you want to have a signature model out with and stuff like that. 
But um, no, I play the guitars because I love them. I didn't start out with Nags to have a signature model. Um, I didn't even start out with Nags trying to get an endorsement. I just, I went there and I love guitar factories and I and had a great conversation with Joe and he offered to build me a guitar and that's where it got, all that started. Oh yeah. And, it, and it, then at one point, because I was doing so much stuff, they asked me about doing a signature model of the guitar that I was always playing, already playing. So, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, I got to play that guitar. Remember you let me play it for a minute and it's a beautiful, beautiful guitar. Um, I want to, uh, I think the nags I want is called the Hunga. Is that how you say it? Really? Yeah. 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 An SG. Yeah. Right. See, here's the thing. I went down the, the rabbit hole of trying, cause you know, it's hard to find the nags guitars. There's not a lot of dealers for them. And, you know, cause they're more specialized guitars. Um, cause you know, they're not, they're not inexpensive. That's for sure. And, um, Playing them all, I like the Sovereign a lot. Sovereign X. See, I learned the hard way. I don't like the Sovereign. I like the Sovereign X. I like the 12-inch radius fretboard, which is what you have. I didn't oh. love, yeah, I didn't love the eight and a half thing or whatever. This is eight and a half, 8.5. Oh, yours is eight and a half? See? Yeah. I don't know. Then I don't know. I mean, maybe yours just played great that night, but I decided I didn't like that as much as the 12-inch. So I think I like the X more. But what I really learned is playing them all is no, it's for me, it's the hunger. It's that thing is like, it's funny. You said SG I, it's SGS. It's just everything in SG isn't that guitar is. Um, and uh, I'm, I search, I have, I have my daily, I have my daily searches for them out there trying to find them in the wild, you know, you're just trying to find the right one. I, I don't want to order one. Um, I, uh, I've learned the hard way, you know, you can't review 800 guitars at this point and not learn this. You need to find the guitar. You know what I mean? That you want. Yeah. Does it make sense? I can order stuff and you, you try to calculate how it's going to end up in your mind and, and, uh, you know, so, but yeah, that's, that's going to be the one I get for sure. In fact, there's a white one I'm looking at. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, the Hongas are, are, uh, are interesting guitars. Um, I was never a huge SG fan, and then uh, my friend Dave talked me into buying a, an SG Junior years ago, and I, I picked it up and it played. It didn't do that thing that the the SGs do where they, the balance is weird, yep. and uh, it has one P90, and um, I it would the store gave me like a crazy discount on it. And so I bought it and it was here. And I was like, I don't know why I bought this thing. And one day I was producing um, a band called Southern Park Funk that I was playing in. And uh, it came time to do a soul. It came time to do uh, the telly thing. I had a telly out and so to do a part. And I went to pick up the telly. So let me see what this guitar does. And I picked it up and go, oh, this is totally wrong for what, but let me try something else. And that guitar sang like crazy. So I was like, all right, this is cool. And then, and it's I still have it. It's in the it's in the case. I don't really use it too much anymore. Um, uh, I did a guitar clinic at uh, uh, East Chester Music Center. They were a Nags dealer, and the guy that does repairs, he's like, yeah, I, you know, these it's 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 hard for me when we sell Nags because he ended up buying three guitars like that. He goes, I just got this purple hunga, and I'm like, oh really? I haven't I haven't even played one of those. And I played it, and I was like, oh no, get this thing away from me. It is too, uh, it was amazing. I was like, <laughs> it was like, it, it did everything that you wanted an SG to do, but then everything that you did not, uh, every, it didn't do anything that you did not want an SG to do. And it just felt like, oh yeah. And I still, it's always in the back of my mind. Maybe I should get a hung. I'm like, no, I don't really need another guitar right now. I... But um, it's great. They are great. They are addicting. Um, and you, they, they're so easy to play. I don't know what, what's the radius on that. What's the fretboard radius on that? That one's I think twelve. I okay. um that guitar. What happened was a viewer who saw you got the nags bug and uh -huh. bought that, and then brought it to me uh, because believe it or not, because uh, they bought it secondhand and it came with the original pickups, but the the new owner put new pickups, so uh -huh. they asked me if I would swap it back to stock. Okay. So I did the swap out. And of course, after you're done with it, you play it. And then I was like, oh, this is it. Whatever I've been looking for, this is it. But they didn't want to, of course, sell theirs. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> so um that guitar is 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 crazy because when you pick it up in fact most people i know that picked up like oh this is great there was a guy on the nexus forum that was selling his and like the next day he goes no nope, i'm not selling it i took it polished it up to sell played it a little bit and said no i'm not getting rid of this guitar <laughs> yeah they're they're hard to find uh out there in the wild right now you know because of the market stuff but yeah i'll find one but yeah that's the one i figured we'll it probably out look, i'll look out for one uh, you know me i i probably something boring i like i said the one i'm looking at is opaque it's white there was a green one that was cool i don't need a a fancy top or anything i could care less um i didn't uh anything that i actually play that i love mm -hmm. it just gets brutalized like i have no Mine yeah, too. Mine yeah too. well like you know how that could, perfect example your guitar right there you hand that guitar to people and you're like here play my guitar right I, when there's a guitar that I bond with, uh, it's like I drag it everywhere, downstairs, it lays on the couch, it's leaning against the wall, I hand it to people, I just, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not an investment, quote unquote, it's not for a collection, it's not for anything other than just it's my workhorse guitar. So whenever I know there's a guitar because that that's going to be like that, I don't really care about fanciness, you know what I mean? I'm just, because I know I'm going to do something to it that's uh, nick it. <laughs> I seem to always, you know, do something stupid to them. Yeah, no, it just they're, they're uh, they go through life just like we have Nick Dicks, Nick, dents and and nicks on us. Yeah, <laughs> they go through life, and so yeah, there are dents on my guitar. I got the wear and pick guard here. Yeah, I saw that. I was noticing that you you just got a spot going there. Is that yeah. from your pinky? I don't know. It's from it's from me playing. I mean, are you strumming I, it? Yeah. So I'm touching this guitar every day. So. I don't know. Yeah. It's wearing the uh so the 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 neck is stained to match the pickguard. This is the regular maple pickguard, regular maple neck, but it's stained. At one point I was thinking, I like the look of koa. And then I was talked out of that. They're like, yeah, you don't really want a koa, koa neck. And I was like, okay. Um, and I trust, I, I go to trust. Um so this is stained, and I think probably the uh oil from my hands or something like that is is it's gone to the finish. It's wearing on that right there. But other than that, I just have dents and nicks and stuff like that. Um, I have a gash on one of my guitars that I still don't know where it's from. But you know, it's impossible to get to, to drag it around around the world and and uh, and do shows and and not have dents and nicks. Yeah. Well, for me, it's uh, it's the problem is like I said when I like a guitar, which is the which happens, you know, just like you, you find a guitar and bond with it. Do I drag it everywhere? Like I don't, I don't, I don't care anymore. I just drag it everywhere. Um, yeah. I, that's why it's funny. I'm really, I've been like that my whole life. The problem is that my profession is I demo so much product, I review product that I'm, you know, everybody's like, oh, he's just always got a different guitar. But realistically, if there's not a camera on me because I'm not making content. Yeah, it's probably like the same two guitars all the time, yeah. just to the point. Um, yeah. And um, and I have, uh, just because we're talking about it, I have the exact opposite problem that you have. Your guitar becomes your sound. You know what I mean? And vice versa, right? You play that guitar. Uh, like you said, you obviously like the way the lead tones on that guitar sounds. That's why you're recording it in albums and stuff. Um, when you do reviews and stuff, you're trying to find things that, that they're looking for. You know what I mean? Like if I'm reviewing a blues pedal, I don't grab my, you know, you don't grab a, a you know shredder guitar it doesn't make any sense right so you grab like products that make sense um if i used my guitar that i like to play all the time all the time in every video mm -hmm. it it colors that every video's react you know sound so to speak sure i get it yeah. well the same thing with recording i have uh, i have a, a few guitars here and it's primarily for recording it's to ha have on it because i produce singer songwriters world music uh native american contemporary Christian rock, um, lots of, lots of different things. So I have different guitars for different things and stuff like that. Um, but still in order to, you know, on my records, I still, well, I have my set of guitars, which are, you know, <laughs> my nags. And now I have, uh, I have the, uh, J the Kanai J, which is like a, a junior with one P 90. Right. Which is taking, it's totally taken place of, of that uh, SG junior that I have. Um, 
and then I have a, a Kanai that's got humbuck and pickups in it. And that's a lot like with the Les Paul, you know, it's that it has that kind of vibe to it. Still different, but still has that, that kind of vibe. Um, so I, for my records, I use 90% of the time it's the nags. There might be a telly that works on a track, uh, not on the last two records. And I have a, a Les Paul that just, it's, uh, you know, the R8 that just sits well rhythm wise for uh, for certain things. Um, but everything else it, that I used on, on my records or, or my nags. And yeah. The last, uh, the last two, three, four, five records maybe now, I think it is. I think it's five i think it's five records now well i uh yeah it's it's funny i have a gibson r9 for the same reason that's what i use for recording because they're so fat sounding the next though are just obnoxious you know what i mean Not just, all of them. you had you had you had to go through a bunch to find that guitar <sighs> did you? The, i did the, the the thing with the one i got is i actually had it narrowed down to two of them okay and i was a being them and the problem was the other one's neck was as you like you know slightly thinner which actually made a huge difference. But the one I ended up picking, the tone was just, for some reason, everything was singing out of it correctly. You know what I mean? Tone-wise. Yeah, and sure. I knew deep down, no matter how, how, even if the neck was just slightly thinner, it wouldn't have mattered. There's no way that's your main guitar. Not for me. You know what I mean? It's just, I'm not playing this chunky baseball bat neck all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, I don't, I'm not into thin necks either, but I, I have Goldilocks syndrome for necks. Yeah, it's got to be perfect if it's not per like I don't, too thin it's too you know and, and so you know at this point um you you and phil x it was you two i'm trying to think of there was another one but it was definitely you two man you guys uh i i'm 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 approaching my late late 40s now and you both mentioned to me something casually a couple years ago about hey when you turn 50 like you got to start warming up your hands and things start changing and uh man it's almost like not even yearly monthly i you start noticing that exactly that and you start noticing that again if you're playing the neck that's too thin your hand cramps this way if your neck's too thick your hand cramps this way <laughs> uh yeah. actually ridiculous by the way i, I always like hanging out with, <laughs> with yeah like, well but, you know he uh, oh he told me he told me um it's funny. I don't, it was real funny. That he told me that there's a certain song on Bon Jovi that his hand cramps because he's holding the chords for so long during, because only like two chords, a whole song. Uh -huh. So his hand cramps up. Mm -hmm. And I remember him telling me that, you know, and you know, he's, he's so he's on all the time. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. He's, he's like, there's no act there. Whatever that act is, it's on all the time. He's, yeah, he's, so, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, you, and so I'm like, all right, maybe he's exaggerating a little bit because he's, you know, he's kind of bombastic, right? He's out there. Um, and uh, funny enough, that's what started happening to me is I've learned uh, that if I play necks are too thin or too thick, uh, because now what people, I learn, I've actually got to experience, I told you my world and your world, I get to experience things that you guys experience. Some people watch a nine minute video and realize I have to play like two, three hours to get yeah. those clips. Right. So, so so you're sitting there playing over and over again. And 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 you know, towards the end of the video, the video is done. Now you're editing, and then all of a sudden your hand just you're starting to get the this, the pain here, or the tenderness, you know what I mean, here and on your hand. And uh and my problem is uh, is unlike uh, uh maybe what you guys have to go through sometimes is sometimes if I'm demoing a guitar. It, I don't have a choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. The company sends us a guitar with a giant neck. That's the guitar I got to review and I'm reviewing it, even though I'm like, after two hours, I'm like, oh, that was a workout. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I have a little hand issue that when I, I don't play steel string acoustic for more than a half hour a day. So I get numbness and then it turns into pain and stuff. But, uh, and that happened, started happening after my first acoustic record in 96. Um, but yeah, I remember being in Japan backstage at, uh, the Ibanez, Ibanez 100th anniversary party. And, uh, uh, 
I've known Steve Vai for a long time and we casually talk, but we actually st uh, uh, started speaking a lot more at, from that experience there. And one of the things we bonded over was um, Steve warms up at like concert volume for a while. <laughs> yes. I, I think almost an hour to two hours sometimes. But um, we would just start talking about warming up and it's like, when I was uh, in my 20s, I didn't have to warm up. I would just, I could walk in from the cold in New York and just and hit the stage and start playing. Now I got to warm up. I have to warm up. I have to warm up before my Tuesday night live shows, my Sunday night live streams. I definitely got to warm up before show. Steve, we were talking about that. Uh, we've actually had several conversations about that. And, you know, Steve had hand issues this year. He had to have surgery and yep. did that crazy video where he's just playing with one hand, like insane stuff. Uh, it's wear and tear uh, and just getting older and stuff. You just have to warm up. Steve has to warm up. He, we both were talking about how important it is to like, okay. Uh, and it's also like, I, I guess I have to warm up less if I'm doing, I still have to warm up, but if I'm doing um, a sideman gig, singer songwriter, where I'm doing a lot more, uh, uh, you know, half the songs are. I might be doing that a lot. In but when we're doing, you're used to doing like your instrumental guitar records. There's no way I have to warm up and I'm just doing that. Still not doing it. approach those stretches or just to get any kind of accuracy at all without warming up well but, you know. luckily i learned i learned something it was a weird experience i had in in basic training they make you go through this thing called an obstacle course it's like a they call it the confidence course I, people call it an obstacle course but it's called confidence course because i guess at the end of basic you're supposed to feel good once you accomplish this thing right um, I have no problem admitting this, by the way, I'm afraid, deathly afraid of heights. And when I'm on the pirate tower, I actually started crying. I did it, but I was crying. It was a very unmasculine thing to do in front of a drill sergeant, but I was freaking out. But anyways, the important part of the story is not that just that I just like to humiliate myself publicly constantly by that comment. <laughs> but here's what's funny. They have something called a Jacob's ladder. Okay. Everybody's seen it. It's in, it's been, if trust me, if you ever seen an FBI movie or an army movie, whenever they're doing, you know, whatever they're doing on these courses, there's these two telephone poles that go straight up in the air and there's like these logs that go up and down this thing and they go up one side and they come down the other. It's called a Jacob's ladder because they're spaced unevenly. So two logs could be two feet apart. Two logs will be three feet apart. What the reason why they do that is if you're tall, when you're up high and you get to the point where all of a sudden you have to kind of bend over almost to do the, the two logs that are narrow together, it's very scary. But if you're short, you have to reach up hard to the high one. So at some point, I don't care who, how tall or short you are, there are steps in this ladder that suck for you. Okay. The reason I like that is what I learned from that, talk about great at an early age was guitar became this thing where everybody just said, oh, you have big hands because you have big hands. Like Paul Gilbert, you have huge hands, mm -hmm. right? And people go, oh, you have big hands. That's easy. I have small hands. That's hard. And what I've learned is, no, guitar is a Jacob's ladder. It sucks for everyone somewhere in the situation. There's something that sucks. Um, yeah. And what I learned is, like, for instance, your ring finger right now when you're making chords, right now I'm watching you do it. You're doing this thing where your finger goes here and then bends straight down like that. You see it? If you watch somebody with smaller hands, they come at it straight. They don't, they don't have to bend that down, right? And so, so that's what's funny. If you really watch people on their hands and players and their hands, you realize like everybody has to adapt something. Different choices. Um, I was the annoying kid that anytime I saw somebody with a guitar, I would go, I, I had to ask him one question. I had to learn something from, because I'm self-taught uh, or community taught, I should say. I didn't have any formal lessons really. I had to go and go, hey, 
how are you doing at court? So there was one guy that I used to go to that would do things. And um, I would see him play and I go, how are you doing at court? And he had small, I mean, really small hands. And the way he would, the voicings that he chose and the way he would do it, hold it, I would try and do that and it didn't make sense to me. And yep. I remember seeing, there was a guy named Mike Rid, uh, Rideski. He uh, played with Boy George. He was the gentleman that passed away in George, Boy George's house. Great guitar player, great big hands. And I saw him playing some chords that I knew and I was like, why are you doing it that way? He goes, I don't know, this is what feels comfortable to me. And I tried to do it and I was like, oh, this makes so much more sense. Why am I trying to squeeze into, you know, I don't have to do it, hold my hand this way and squeeze that. Uh, it made more sense to me to hold the chords a little bit the way that Mike does. So at that point, that taught me, and I think I was probably 13 or 14 at the time, uh, that I just need to learn the information of why they're doing something and how they're doing it, but I can still do it my own way. And I kind of approach everything that way. But yeah, you can have small hands and it, and uh, people fly by and they're doing all this cool stuff. And you can have big hands and people are flying by and just, it has nothing to do. As long as you realize what you have, then what works for you, then that's the best. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I said it's kind of it's kind of funny. Um, yeah, look at the, the fretboard in my <laughs> so I can't, I, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense to hold it a certain way. You know, in fact, I can't stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and like I said, this is this is what's great about having conversations about guitar, all the stuff, you know, you pick up. I am. Um, like I said, I'm not kidding when you and Phil X, you you had done it in the same year. I, forget, I think it was 2018. You had both said something to me that year, just in passing. You meant nothing by it, either one of you. It was in something conversation. But of course, you know, you kind of aha moment. And obviously, 18, 2018, I started doing a lot more YouTube content. And then all of a sudden, you know, through I'm playing way more than I used to play, right? And all of a sudden, I started just noticing things like, like 10 hours no exaggeration, like eight, 10 hours after I recorded a video that morning, I'm like, man, my arm hurts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Having this like ghost pain right here when I'm sitting down going, what, what is that from? Did I hit myself somewhere? And then yeah. you just, and then you're like, yeah. So you learn, you got to warm up. Yeah. You know, I have one tip I think works. Okay. I'm still in the middle of it and it's working for me. Um, I am trying to get better at playing just really nice stuff. So uh, there's a guy on Instagram I, I follow and I subscribe to his uh, Patreon page, like $7 a month. And he just, every time he plays something, it's just beautiful. Um, the reason I brought that up is uh, you saw, I mean, I've been sitting here warming up and I'm doing scales and stuff like that. Um, that's not how I started today. Uh, if you can, I think, cause you, you know, if, you, if I was doing a show, that's where I'm gonna end up playing a whole hour 90 minutes or more like that so i start uh simple. I might do rhythms to loosen up my, my, uh, my, uh, my right hand. I don't have anything without a delay, do I? Yeah, well, sorry, I, I don't have a <laughs> the right patch. Um, but anyway, so Instead of starting out, a lot of times I see people warm up and they just start playing as fast as they can and stuff like that. That's probably doing more harm than good. Um, because you're warming up to get to that point. Don't right. start out at that point. So I might just warm up with that. And 
and also it makes me do, even though I'm not doing it right now, more musical things. Totally not doing it right now, but anyway, uh, I've seen people start to warm up in uh, backstage and they immediately start with. And it's like that, and that defeats the purpose. You're warming up to get to that point, you know, to get you. Don't start out with your fastest as a warm up. Um, Cause then you're not warming up. Your muscles are like, oh, we're, we're waking yeah. up. <laughs> few times and um, he's usually doing something uh, that's maybe musically advanced but uh, technically not super advanced it's just he's just drifting a little bit doing his thing and then, uh, then later on like that he'll, he'll start doing um, more technical stuff but I think warming up really means just like getting it in your hands yeah and doing stuff that's comfortable um and easing into stuff that's more that's that's more harder to do yeah. yeah i i um actually it's funny i when i interviewed steve i i you know the camera was rolling the whole time he did his warm-up before he started doing the interviews that day and so i had the footage of that and you, you're right he was playing chord stuff he was playing basic stuff mm -hmm. um uh because they put him in the room you know how they do it they put him in the room and then you know you you go each person does like 20 minutes of content with him um yeah. and he was warming up and uh i i do the same thing as you i play some chords i play some stuff i'm familiar with something just again to get the temperature of my hand up a little bit you know so it's not cold mm -hmm. um and then uh the other thing i learned that worked i uh, talk about a, a weird thing that i learned uh that's really cool is um they asked paul gilbert of all the people i've ever heard you know uh you know this question we've all heard it what gauge strings do you use his answer was probably the most unique i've ever heard which was at the beginning of the tour it's nines in the middle of the tour it's tens and at the end of the tour it's elevens right and when he said that i was like again just like everything in my life you know you hear it it's in there you can do with it what you want um i've played nines for years years and years and then as I was making all this content, I would start pushing things really sharp. Like I was just bending stuff. Like the nines became almost like a joke. And then I mm -hmm. thought, what's going on? Like, am I, you know, am I getting stronger? You know, and you, you are, you're physically just playing so much more. Uh, so I switched my guitars to tens and then I started playing tens all the time. And, uh, you know, it was nice for the ego. All of a sudden I was like, man, I guess all my life I was wrong. I'm a tens guy. And then what happened was, uh, you know, I start making videos that are like five things you don't know videos or whatever I'm doing. I'm not playing as much now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And literally your playing time for weeks goes in half or a quarter what it's normally is. And then I pick up a guitar tens and I go to do a bend. And it was, I thought like, who, who tuned, tuned my guitar up a whole step? What's going on? <laughs> and then you realize like, oh my gosh, I never thought about this. This is like that. Uh, what's that? The Bowflex. The Bowflex. Yeah. Strings are like a weight set. Yeah. Yeah. You got you got to work out. Yeah, you or, got you, gotta, you know there are, there are a lot of big singers there's two real big singers I don't sure mention their names but I know the bands um one's a band one was one is no longer alive but one, he was a, a amazing singer but they had to uh when back when people used to do 9 month tours 6 months in the all the the tuning is no longer standard. Oh yeah, you drop the tuning because right. of the vocal cords, and then and nine months in, they're dropping them again. Uh, and one of those bands that we all know and love, um, with their first singer, they had to drop quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it, it, it's this is again, this is it's great. It's real talk about this stuff. Athletes talk about this stuff. I'm not really big into sports, but when you watch athletes talk, mm-hmm. this is the conversations they have. How do they become better athletes? Musicians are the weirdest bunch of group of people. We don't talk about like this kind of stuff, which is how you actually become better, right? Um, we talk about, I don't know, pedals. I don't know whatever it is we talk about. You do, have, you do want to work on getting better. If you're, if you're not, if you're not getting better, then you're, I don't know, uh, you're just getting stagnant. And yeah. Yourself and everybody else around you. Um, but yeah, I, I was looking to get better at, at something, uh, in any of the facets I'm doing, <laughs> I have to get better at, uh, or different too, you know? Yeah. So, um, on that note, before we go, we got to yeah. mention, I'll put links down below for your Tuesday, uh, live show and the Sunday live show. Thank you. Um, you can pretty much just join Larry's Facebook page and then they'll get exposed to the live shows. Right. So yeah, or, you, or my YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, I'll put links to that stuff as, as well. Link to your website. Cause I, and you can get the, the new albums, right? Yeah, uh, the new albums are, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get too much into the music business, but I decided to to keep the, uh, when I released them, released them uh, Shadows of the Soul, Shadows of the Soul, Shadows, Shadows on the Soul, uh, the electric record, and then the Light Within, the acoustic record, um, to keep them off of Spotify for now. So it's been a year, over a year, or it's been a year, actually it's been a year this week. Um, they're only available on Bandcamp. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, right. At the beginning of next year, uh, there's probably going to be a three song EP available that will be on of, of uh, three of the songs from Shadows on the Soul, which will be available on all the platforms and stuff like that. But um, if you, I don't really want to get too much into music business, but uh, those two records in three months brought me more income on Bandcamp than the other records that I had on all of those streaming platforms. Right. Yeah. So I I kept it off of those for a while and I'm going to do slightly different versions for the, for the, all the platforms of three songs, just three songs next, you know, for next year. Right. Uh, there's a whole other uh, reason why I want to do that as well, but and not just the, the why I'm going to put those on Spotify, but that's a whole different different thing. Spotify and Amazon and iTunes and stuff like that. Yeah, but right. Yeah. They're only available on Bandcamp. Uh, everything else, almost everything else, is available on your normal where you can stream normally and stuff like that. Yeah. And well, I think that was a smart decision. And again, this is the reason why we have conversations like this. I think this is absolutely, uh, again, it's a, they are going to, musicians need to keep evolving. Yeah. The, the world is changing. There's, like you said, there's tons of opportunities. You can put yourself out there. Here's the great thing. You can put yourself out there for absolutely free. The, that's the great thing. The horrible thing is you can put yourself out there for absolutely free. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you have to, uh, I like to point out one thing that's funny is, uh, and then we'll on, end on this note. Um, if you watch Larry uh, live, uh, you know, he has CDs you can buy, you know, uh, you know, you have merch. Mm-hmm. I should put it this way. It's merch. What I loved about your merch the most was I, I bought your shot glass, right? Okay. Uh, and the reason I love that is, again, I use that shot glass. Well, plus I use it all the time because whiskey is amazing. But I, I use that as, an, uh, as a, uh, a way of explaining to people about how bands sometimes need to think more than just like buy my CD. CD is at the table so to speak, you know, right. You know, um, you want people, um, to, and then again, this is again, just good for, for people. I believe this in my core being when it comes to merch, a merch is just a delivery vehicle for people to support what you do. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So many musicians now, I think for some reason, cause there is a, there is a logic to what they're thinking. They think the merch is the value. You know what I mean? Like buy my shirt, 
because you, you know you want a shirt. You want to walk around with this shirt. And there's a value to that. But really, it's nice because most people think, well, who doesn't need a shirt? And if I buy this shirt, I'm supporting someone that I appreciate and want to support. The shirt is a tangible vehicle for the delivery of support. I like whiskey. You have a shot glass. <laughs> I don't even drink, but I have a shot glass. Yes. Huh? I don't even drink. <laughs> Yeah. what's what's great is you don't have to drink liquor out of a shot glass you can right. use it as a measuring device hey you can put your picks in it <laughs> no i i drink out of it but i don't drink it. yeah but yeah yeah do lots of things with that. but cool i'm glad you like the shot glass do you have a yo-yo I ha you have a yo-yo right i do i have a yo-yo as well again same thing this the concept of you know how can you how can you support an artist with with other things, but it's, you know, because the reality is that, you know, Spotify ain't going to pay no bills ever. <laughs> and, and people mean, well, I, I remember years ago, people will come up to the table and go, Oh, what is, I just bought your record on, on iTunes or I bought it year. Now it says, Oh, I'm, I found you on Spotify streaming and streaming on Spotify. What else do you have for sale? <laughs> and cause they don't have, like you said, they don't have CD players or whatever. So they still want to support. And that's why I had shot, uh, shot glasses. I had uh, t-shirts for a while. I have water bottles now. I have um, I had uh, I have yo uh, yo-yos because um, I do some stuff with kids. And uh, every now and then a kid would come to a show, and I just needed it. It's like, oh, this would be great, and it's worked out great. There were more more adults that were buying the yo-yos, but it, it was only for like occasionally kids would come to a show. Uh, and I had coloring books too. Um, uh, which more older, older people would buy the color books than, than kids. Uh, it's just the way it's just the way it was. But um, but people want to support and they want to. It's like tipping, but they get something else out of it as well. Right. Yeah. And and um, uh, I watched uh, and again, which is kind of great. I watched uh, of all people, it was Paul Reed Smith himself, the Paul Paul Smith. He was doing a wacky interview somewhere. And the conversation was on endorsements, musicians endorsing products. And he said, in today's climate, um, musicians have to make money every avenue they possibly can. That's how the world works now. And he said, you know, he was talking of the, of the uh, he was talking on the subject of shaming musicians. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you, you know what we're talking about. We're talking about like, you know, like Eddie Van Halen only sells guitars for the money kind of concept, right? And Paul's attitude was, which is interesting because it's not normally his attitude. <laughs> his in attitude was interesting because he said basically like, no, this is the future. Musicians have to learn every avenue there is to make money because so much of the way that they make money is given away for free now. Yes. And usually there's a, a whole lot of other people making money off of the musician. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, you have to find multiple streams of income that make it work. And you don't want it again when when things once one system goes away for a little while or permanently, you know, you have to have other systems to that uh that are going to that are in effect that that pick up the slack or where you can turn to. But yeah, I, yeah, I um I don't I don't know if musicians should uh that's everybody's personal decision to do, do endorsements just for money. No, but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, people are making money off of them. So they, you know, they want to be a part of it. And they, that they want to off themselves as well. Then they could do that. Yeah. You could do that. Absolutely. If I'm, if I'm being clear or not. No, no, it made total sense. Mm -hmm. All right, Larry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. As always, it's great to hang out with you and talk to you. And uh, you. and like I said, everybody, everybody check the links down below for all the ways to get a hold of all Larry's stuff. Well, as always, I hope you guys enjoyed this a bonus podcast. And I want to thank Larry for hanging out with me. Uh, again, this was great. It was just like two friends hanging out and talking. And that's pretty much what it was. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe and uh, be ready for the next video.